Oh yeah, then it's normal. It's under tatahi de tsuyos. Okay, so uh, in general, they say that if you establish a particular bardo, so for example, if you establish the bardo of a hell being, that uh, thing is irreversible, meaning you will have to experience uh, uh, and take a rebirth in the hell. So they say it is impossible once you have established the bardo, the hell bardo, to then somehow take a good rebirth as a human or a god. However, higher Abhidharma, the Kundu, um, mentions that this is possible. And also, Geshe Potawa makes the statement that it is possible to change the bardo. So even if a bad rebirth bardo is established, by doing specific practices and dedicating the root of uh, virtue that we create for the deceased, that can have an effect and can change the bardo. So based on those statements, we have this tradition of uh, doing regular prayers uh, and practices, especially every week for the deceased. Now the statement that Geshe Bodawa says is that if those who have who belong into the same family lineage those who have common wealth and those who have a dharma relationship make dedicate the root of virtue it can be very beneficial so what is the first one the family lineage so for example if the parents die in a family, those who belong to the same family, such as the children or other close relatives, they can practice and establish a strong root of virtue. And then they can dedicate this root of virtue so that the parents who have died, right, even though they might have established a, a bardo for a lower migration, that they reverse that bad bardo and instead they establish a bardo for a favorable, a good migration. Then we have the, seven the second category, which is the category of those who have common resources. Means if you have a share in the property or the wealth of the deceased. So again, you fall in this category of people who can practice and then you dedicate the practice and you dedicate the practice so that you can reverse an unfavorable bardo into a much better rebirth. And finally, we have those who have a Dharma connection. Dharma connection here refers to uh, teachers and students. So let's say that a student passes away the teacher can do prayers and those can be very beneficial when they are dedicated for the sake of the student. So even though they might have established a bardo for a lower migration, they can change this into a bardo for a human rebirth or a god rebirth and so on and so forth. So there is always a scope for changing a bardo that has already been established and these are common practices that we do. Okay, so if we look at the, the experience of the bardo beings, those who are bardo beings of lower migrations, they have this uh, experience of moving into darkness. And also the way that they move is that the body is reversed, so the head is uh, heading downwards, so, so they are moving downwards almost as if they are falling. Those who have established a good bardo of a human or a god, they have this appearance of entering into this bardo that is lit by moonlight. So it's not a total darkness or anything like that. And also they move upwards and the head is in the upward position or they move straight forward. Now, in terms of their colors, uh, the colors of the bodies are different according to the type of the bardo they have established. So someone who has established the bardo of a hell being has a color of completely bar dark black, like a burnt piece of wood. Someone who has established the bardo of a hungry ghost has a color that resembles the color of water. Someone who has established the bardo of an animal has the a color of smoke. Uh, someone who has the bardo of a human or a god, uh, they have um, a golden color. Um, someone who has the bardo of the, of the form realm has um, a white color. For the formless realm, there's no bardo to establish. 
Now, in terms of the duration of the life of the bardo being, so we say that the bardo is established simultaneously with death. So you die and you transfer into the bardo existence. Now, some remain in that bardo only for a very short time and they take a rebirth very quickly. Some might remain in that bardo for one day or for even more than days. Some remain in the bardo for seven days. Now, at the end of those seven days, if they have not found uh, the right conditions for another rebirth, then they die again and are reborn again in the bardo. So then they begin their second week of existence in the bardo. So hopefully by the second week, they will find another place for rebirth. But if they don't, again, they die and are reborn in the bardo. And so you, can, you might find bardo beings who remain there up to seven weeks, right? At the end of the seventh week, which is the 49th day, it is for certain that finally they will get a rebirth and they will move out of the bardo. So the longest the life of a bardo being that will be is 49 days. And this is why there is the strong tradition of making a lot of prayers and practices on the seventh day, every seventh day, and on the 49th day. Okay, so we see here that the bardo has come into an end at the end, at the maximum at the seventh week, and then they have to take rebirth. So we know that there are four types of rebirth. You can be reborn in the womb, in the egg, by heat or miraculously. In the case of the two the first two types of rebirth, where is the rebirth in the womb and rebirth in an egg, what happens is that uh, you come into the vicinity uh, of your future parents at the time where they engage in intercourse. And if you are, for example, going to be reborn as a female, what you do is you develop very strong aversion for the, uh, for the future mother and you develop attachment for the male that will become your future father. If you're going to be reborn as a boy, you have the opposite. You have aversion towards the male who will be your father, and you have a strong attachment towards the female that will be your mother. So you are driven towards that couple with these strong emotions. And as you do that, at that point, you can only focus on their sexual organs, like you cannot perceive any other part of their body. It's like you can only perceive this grotesque, enlarged, or, you know, vision of their sexual organs. And through anger, um, you generate anger due to this vision. And this is what puts an end to the bardo existence. So you can see that actually you are conceived, your consciousness is conceived in that, in that mixture or the union of the sperm and the egg uh, because you have misconceived this basis that will become the basis of your next rebirth. Okay, so... Um, if, uh, let's say, we have someone who has uh, done a lot of heavy negativity whilst they were alive. So let's take the example of a butcher. So a butcher typically would be killing quite a lot of animals, right, every day of his life. So when he comes to the end of his life, at the end of the bardo, he actually would have those visions um, of animals that he has killed, and it will not be an, an easy experience. Um, for others, for example, that are going to be reborn in the hells, um, some might have developed this attachment or craving for heat, and because they have craving for heat, that will lead them to take rebirth in the hot hells. Others will have cravings some, some, for some cool or cold, and that will lead them to take rebirth in the cold hells. 
So um, as you can see here, we have been looking at this outline, very important outline, thinking about the source of suffering, the stages that cause you to enter within samsara. We have identified that those causes are karma and affliction. And uh, from these two, the most important is the afflictions. Afflictions is what motivates us and what causes us to create and accumulate karma. Then through the karma that we have accumulated, we as we that karma projects us into another existence within samsara and establishes those contaminated and appropriated aggregates once we establish those um, appropriated aggregates that are contaminated we will experience a great type and amount of suffering so you can see here the function of afflictions afflictions in the first place causes us to accumulate karma and later on, afflictions are the ones that activate the karma so that you, we will take another rebirth. Once we establish a new rebirth, uh, we establish a new set of contaminated aggregates for as long as um, those aggregates are still valid, right? Because they have a certain duration. So for the duration of that existence, we continue to accumulate uh, more and more projecting karma. Then we arrive at the time of death, and at the time of death, different types of minds might become manifest, either virtuous or non-virtuous or neutral states of mind. Um, Although we arrive at the end of one life, it doesn't mean that everything stops because consciousness actually continues. At the time of death, consciousness will move into the next phase of existence, which is the bardo existence. And then when that bardo existence also comes into an end, that consciousness will take another life through the process of conception. So it is very important for us to look at this outline and properly understand. We need to understand what are the sources of suffering? What are the things that cause us to enter within samsara? Because if we develop a proper understanding of that, we can see the mechanism of that, we can see how this happens, it can help us reverse long, uh, wrong ideas ideas that say that samsara is causeless or wrong ideas that actually misunderstand what is the proper cause that establish samsara. Also, we will come to see what is the root of samsara and by seeing this, we will develop the wish that says we want to uproot it. This will make us take interest in engaging the three higher trainings. And basically, when we can understand all this, it's like we make the promise, we have the determination, we have the aspiration that says, I will train in this way, I will uproot that root of samsara. Okay, so we have looked at the way of um, explaining the origin of suffering and how we enter within samsara in this uh, brief presentation. Uh, however, there is another presentation that we mentioned that is the presentation according to the 12 links. In the swift path and the easy path, because they are short lumbering texts, they do not have any mention of the 12 links of dependent origination. However, if you look at more extensive lumbering texts, such as lumbering chenmo, you will find a presentation of the 12 links. Now, there is nothing wrong with this presentation that we have given here. We say that due to uh, the power of afflictions, you accumulate karma. From this karma, you will uh, arrive at the end of your death. You will establish the bardo. And after bardo, this, you will take another rebirth. It's a short presentation and it's fine. However, for certain types of individuals, a more elaborate presentation as presented or organized in the 12 links is more suitable, more appropriate. Furthermore, we do have the... Uh, story of King Udrayana of the Central Land, 
who met the Buddha at the time of the Buddha, and the Buddha actually gave him this present of um, a tanka or a scroll that had the famous uh, painting of uh, the Wheel of Life. And in that we have the 12 links and the six types of migrating beings and so forth. And it is said that for some individuals, it is just a presentation that it is very suitable. And guess uh, Puchungwa used to really um, dwell in the presentation of the 12 links. He will, would utilize this. He would teach that a lot, especially when he was uh, teaching the path that he shared with the individual of the small skull. So Geshe would like to go into a presentation of the 12 links. It would not be very elaborate, but at least we will enumerate those 12 links. All right, so let's uh, begin first of all by enumerating. The first one at the beginning is ignorance. The second one is karmic composition. The third one is consciousness. The fourth one is name and form. The fifth one is the six bases. The seventh one, uh, sorry, yeah, the fifth one is the six bases. The sixth one is contact. The seventh one is feeling. The eighth one is craving. The ninth one is taking. The tenth is existence. The eleventh is rebirth. And the twelfth is aging and death. All right, so let's look at the nature of each one of those. So the first one is ignorance. So ignorance here is something that we have been under the influence of that since beginningless time. It is the root of cyclic existence. It is the confusion that is grasping at the self. So you might be focusing either on the person or a phenomenon other than the person and believe that it truly exists or it exists established from its own characteristics. Then due to this type of ignorance, due to this type of grasping, we go ahead and we establish all sorts of different types of karma, uh, virtuous and non-virtuous karma. They're all projecting karma, and projecting means they project us to another existence, to another set of aggregates. Therefore, it, is, it becomes obvious that if there is one thing that we must abandon is this ignorance. And the way that we abandon it is by clarifying it by using logic. And by using logic, we can come to see that things do not exist the way that we grasp them, the, the way that we believe them to exist. And this is why how eventually we come to this realization of emptiness. Emptiness is extremely important to see and realize because if we realize emptiness, we will be able to overcome and put an end to all samsaric suffering. And therefore, emptiness is something that is very precious and the text that teach emptiness, such as the Plasma Paramita text, are also considered to be very valuable and precious. So there is no other way than to realize emptiness. So if we use that logic and we keep meditating on it, we will be able to put an end to ignorance and therefore we will not accumulate karma. If we do not accumulate this type of karma, we will not... Um, project another type of rebirth in cyclic existence. It means we will not establish another set of aggregates. If we do not establish another set of aggregates, there will not be any experience of aging and death. So this is how we will put an end to the suffering of samsara. We come to the second of the 12 links, which is composition. Composition here refers to karmic composition. So uh, again, motivated by that initial ignorance, we create uh, all this uh, accumulation of karma that we do. Now, um, in terms of our ignorance, actually there are two types of ignorance. Ignorance in terms of the law of cause and effect and ignorance in relation to vastness or emptiness. Ignorance in relation to the law of cause and effect will cause us to create um, non-virtuous um, karma. Ignorance we, in relation to vastness or emptiness causes us to create virtuous karma 
or immovable karma. All right. So you can see that in terms of karmic composition, basically we have three types. You can have meritorious, non-meritorious, and immovable karma. And they will come through different types of ignorance, either ignorance in terms of the law of causation or ignorance in terms of emptiness. We come to the third one, which is consciousness. All right, so um, we see on the second step that we create karma. So when we create karma, what we have is the imprints or the potency of this karma that needs to be deposited upon something. So this uh, karma that is created is deposited upon the consciousness. And this is called the consciousness at the time of the cause, right? So it is the consciousness. We examine consciousness at the time where the cause, which is the karma, is created and the karma is placed upon it. Okay, so we have presented the first three of the 12 links that are ignorance, karmic composition and consciousness at the time of the cause. Now, it is important to understand that when we look at the 12 links, the 12 links actually have two groups in them. And within each group, we can recognize some of the links are causes and some are results. So the first group is projecting causes and projected results. And the second group is establishing causes and established results. So with the first three, ignorance, karmic composition and consciousness, we have the projecting causes. All right. Then uh, the fourth one in the list is name and form. Again, what we have to understand here is that there are different ways of looking at the 12 links. You can look at the 12 links as they evolve in the life of the individual. So if you look at it from the perspective of how it evolves from the life of the individual, you would say, okay, I start with ignorance, I accumulate karma, I Deposit, I deposit this karma upon consciousness and then what happens later on actually comes a craving and grasping that activates this karma. So actually from number three we would have to jump to number eight and nine and so forth, right? But here we're following the presentation according to the sutra, so the list. So number four is name and form. So name and form basically here refers to the five aggregates. Name includes the feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness. And form is the aggregate of form. Now, in the very early stages, the form that we're talking about is the, this mixture of ovum and sperm. This is where the consciousness first enters, right? And then from there, we have the uh, different stages of development of the embryo. So those very early embryonic stages represent here form, and the name has all the remaining aggregates. Okay, so uh, number five in the list after name and form is the six bases or the six faculties. So here we establish things such as the eyes and the ears and so forth. So in the previous one, number four, which is name and form, we say that consciousness is actually conceived into, you know, the sperm and the egg, the reproductive uh, um, substances. And at that point, we establish the form, but also the name. And the name means that we have consciousness. However, at this point, we don't have the six bases yet, right? But when we come to number five, we establish those six sense bases. Now, um, having established the six uh, sense bases, we are still not capable of uh, discriminating between objects. So there might be the objects exist, we have the sense faculties and we have consciousness. However, we're not able to put it all together and discriminate yet. Okay, so uh, this sequence that we present here, that name and form is established first,
first and then the six uh, sense faculties are established later. These are things that only apply if you take rebirth in the womb or if you take rebirth in an egg. If you take a miraculous rebirth, um, then name and form and the six sense faculties are established simultaneously not one first and the other one following. Um, also, if you are born in the formless realm, the formless realm does not have form. So for the fourth of the 12 links, you only have name. You don't have name and form, right? And in terms of the six sense faculties, you only have the mental faculty. You don't have any of the other, like the ear faculty and the eye faculty and so forth. Okay, we we'll continue with the next one, which is contact. In when you have contact, now you have three things coming together. You have the object, you have the base or the faculty, and you have the sense consciousness. And remember that in the previous te um, step, you could not discriminate different objects. However, here you can discriminate between objects, and you will find some objects to be pleasant, some objects to be unpleasant, and some to be neutral so contact is the time where you come in co in contact with the object and you can you know categorize it as pleasant unpleasant or neutral following contact the next one number seven is feeling contact as the condition for generating different feelings so we will have feelings of liking disliking or being neutral towards certain objects that we find pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. So as you can see here, we have done number six, which is contact. During contact, you can fully differentiate and you can say this object is very pleasant, this other object is unpleasant, this other object is neutral. Because we have contact, the next one is feeling. We have feeling and obviously if you meet with a, an object that you consider to be pleasant, you experience a feeling of happiness. You like what you meet. If you meet with something unpleasant, pleasant you experience the feeling of suffering and if you meet with something neutral you have a very neutral experience so the next thing that comes after feeling number eight is craving all right once you have experienced a pleasant object and that has made you happy now you are craving for this happiness you don't want this happiness to end if you have met with an unpleasant object that has made you unhappy, has made you suffer, you are craving to be separated from that object. And if you have met with a neutral object that have created a neutral experience for you, you are craving for that neutral feeling to remain. So this is how craving follows immediately after feeling, which follows immediately after contact. What comes after craving is number nine, that is taking. So taking here is uh, the, state, the state where we have intensified the craving, all right? So we said that if you meet with a pleasurable object that makes you happy, you develop this craving where you want to be with that object, right? So now at the stage of taking, this desire for the object becomes attachment for the object. Now, if we look at taking, we can see that we have four subdivisions or four further classifications so they can be taking or grasping you can call it grasping uh, for sensual objects or it can be for views or it can be for ethics and conduct or it can be for assertions about the self so for the first one that is taking or grasping at sensual objects it refers to being really attached to desirable objects the second one uh, that has to do with view is really attached to the view of the perishable. The third one, you become attached to different types of conduct and discipline and ethics. They are inferior conduct, inferior ethics, but you've become attached to it. And the last one is you become 
attached to assertions about the self, about the aggregates, is basically about true existence. Okay, we move into the next one. The next one, number 10, is becoming or existence. Now, remember that uh, during the, due to ignorance, you created some karmic imprints, and those karmic imprints were deposited upon consciousness, isn't it? So now, due to craving and taking, these uh, uh, karmic uh, imprints have been activated. So now they become potent strong enough to project you into a new rebirth and this is where we have the stage of becoming or the stage of existence so you can see from those uh, links that we have examined so far so far we have three that are afflictions afflictions is number one which is ignorance and then number eight that is grasping and number nine that is taking and then we have two that refer to karma we have number two which is the karmic composition when you initially create the karma and number 10 that is becoming where this karma now has become activated and is very potent and is ready to throw you into another rebirth okay so we move into the next one the next one is birth or rebirth okay so we said that craving and grasping or taking have activated the previous karma that you have created that karma becomes intensified and is now potent and it has the power to project you into a new existence into your new rebirth so basically through this process you will be conceived in whichever uh, place of rebirth is appropriate according to the karma that you have activated. So this process of conception uh, into your new existence is number 11, birth. I think we have an airplane passing. All right, so we come to the 12th, which is the last of the 12 links, it's aging and death. So once you have established a new rebirth, you will have a new set of aggregates. These aggregates will change. Gradually, the aggregates change, and this is the process of aging. And finally, there comes a time where the continuum of those aggregates is severed. Right, so it comes the day where they expire, and this is the time of death. So this is the presentation of the 12 links up to here. Okay, so we have presented the 12 links, and we mentioned that within the 12 links, we can find two groups, and within those two groups, we identify some that are causes and some that are results. So we talk about the projecting causes and projected results. This is one group, and then we have establishing causes and established results. So we'll begin with the first one, the establishing causes. And we say that we begin with ignorance, so we create karma, and then that karma is deposited upon consciousness. This can be understood through the example of a person that is sowing seeds in their field, right? So ignorance is like the farmer, the person who is sowing the seeds. Then the karmic composition is like the seeds, and then finally, you understand that those seeds, they have to land somewhere. They have to be deposited upon the field, isn't it? So the, the consciousness upon which all those karmic imprints are deposited are like the field. Okay, so uh, we are at the phase where an individual has sown all their seeds into the ground. And then if you want to have anything growing out of this, you better provide some favorable conditions. So usually what we provide is water and fertilizer. The water and the fertilizer will promote growth, will make that seed, will give that seed the capacity to grow and produce a sprout. 
and before long you will come into the phase where the sprout is just about to emerge. So these phases are corresponding to the phases of craving and taking. Craving and taking are, as we say, are the two elements that intensify whatever karma you have deposited upon consciousness. So they're like the water and the fertilizer that you put there and they intensify or they promote the growth. And then um, after that, we have the number 10, which is becoming or existence. And at this point, is it's like the sprout is almost ready to appear. So with those three, eight, nine, and 10, craving, taking, and existence, we have the establishing causes. So what is happening here, as we say, within the 12 links, we identify certain branches that are causes and some that are results. And then within the causes, you see, we have the projecting causes and we have the establishing causes. So the first three, which is ignorance, karmic formation, and consciousness are the projecting causes. Once you have the projecting causes, that it is suitable for the result, it is possible, it is suitable for the result to come about. However, it is not established yet, right? So it will be established through the establishing causes. So the projecting make it possible that the result will come, the establishing actually establish that result. So once we have in place the projecting and the establishing cause, what will be established, the established result that will come from that is rebirth, that is number 11, and then aging and death, that is number 12. But also from the projecting causes, we will establish what is called the projected result. The projected results are name and form, that is number four. Uh, and then we have uh, five, six, and seven that are the senses, the conduct, and the feeling. So we see that we have projecting uh, causes that are the first three, ignorance, karmic composition, and consciousness. And they, then we have the projected results that are name and form, senses, conduct, and feeling, four, five, six, and seven. We have the establishing causes that are 8, 9, and 10, craving, taking, and becoming. And then we have the established results, 11 and 12, which is rebirth, aging, and death. Okay, so as you can see here, when we look at the 12 links, you could say that half of them are causes and the other half are results. So we have six causes and six results. The six causes are, first of all, the projecting, the three projecting causes, number one, two, and three, ignorance, composition, and consciousness. And then we have the establishing causes, number eight, nine, and 10, craving, grasping, and becoming. Altogether, we have six causes. The first three are called projecting. Uh, projecting causes make it possible that the result will come. However, they do not establish the result. Okay, in order to be certain that the result is established, we must, the projecting causes must be followed by the establishing causes. It is similar with the person who is sowing the seeds in the field. If you leave the seeds there without water and without fertilizer and so forth, you will not get any growth. To make sure that you have, you guarantee to have crops, not just you don't just need to throw the seeds in the ground but also you need to fertilize and water and so forth so this is why we must have the three projecting followed by the three establishing causes okay so we have looked at the six causes and now we're going to look at the six results so the six results are um, four projected results and four established results. So when we were at the phase of the causes, we say that we have causes that are projecting something, but this thing that they are projecting will only be established once the establishing causes are there. 
So once projecting and establishing causes are combined, what do we get? We get the established result and the established results comes with rebirth, aging and death. Now, what about the projected results? The projected results that came from the projecting causes, when will they be established? They will be established once the established results exist. So, um, in the projected results, we have name and form, senses, contact and feeling. And these are things that are established any time from rebirth until you get through aging and death. So, in a sense, the projected results and the established results exist simultaneously, but it, we uh, present them separately because we want to say that the projected results will actually be actualized once the established results are in place. Okay, so let's look at a specific example. So let's say you have a human who uh, is going to take a rebirth as a god. So how is this individual going to establish the 12 links? So uh, once they are still as a human, they um, have the ignorance in terms of the view. So they have the view of the perishable and grasping at their own self they think very strongly, I want to be reborn as a god in my next life, all right? So what they do is they have this fundamental ignorance and due to this ignorance now, motivated by this ignorance, they begin accumulating karma. Obviously, to establish a rebirth as a god, you have to accumulate the appropriate karma, but it is all based or rooted on that fundamental ignorance. So they keep accumulating this karma and in this life, they always um, aspire to be born as a god. They make prayers to be born as a god. They rejoice in everything that they hear about the gods. And by doing this, they are actually further enhancing and activating that karma that they have deposited upon their consciousness. So there we have the initial links of ignorance, karmic composition, and uh, consciousness, and, the, and furthermore, we have craving, taking, and existence. All right, so all of this is established in the life uh, as a human, so in one life. And then that being comes to the end of their life, at the, at the time of death, this karma to be reborn as a god is further activated. They move into the bardo of a god, and then from the bardo of the god, they will move into the existence of the god. So now they have come into the second life, which is the God life. So they establish the rebirth as a God. And as they establish this rebirth as a God, they will establish all the other links, um, the name, the form, the senses, the contact, the feeling. And they will have this as they become older. They have aging as gods. And eventually they will experience death uh, in that uh, god life. So you can see the remaining six resultant links are experienced in another life. And this example actually demonstrates what is the quickest time in which you can complete the whole set of the 12 links. So the quickest you can do it is in two lives. If you do it in two lives, in the first life, you have to establish the six causes. And in the second life, you will experience all the results of those causes. The longest it will take to establish the 12 links is three lives. So in the first life, you will have to establish the projecting causes. So you must have the ignorance, the karmic composition, and then the consciousness. But let's say during that life, you don't have the craving and the grasping that activates the karma, right? So you create all that karma, you deposit the karma, but you don't activate it. So this is the first life. Then in the second, in some next life, you will actually activate that karma. So there will be the craving, the taking and existence, right? And then in the third life, uh, in another life, 
will you will experience all the results the remaining links that are the results of that so the shortest you can do it is in two lives it's impossible to do it in one life and the longest you will do it is three lives all right so as you can see we have given the presentation here according to the 12 links is a presentation of how you enter and engage samsara but uh the previous presentation that we had that was a much shorter presentation of uh, suffering and its origin as being establishing the stages for entering this samsara is a perfectly good uh, presentation i Actually, we can present the 12 links in light of that presentation, try to identify uh, suffering and its origin. We have this verse from Master Nagarjuna where it says, two of them uh, derive from three, seven derive from two. The three occur again, and this is the will of Dharma that it keeps turning. Okay, so we say that uh, two of them derive from three. So the initial three are afflictions, right? So we have ignorance, craving, and grasping. These are the three afflictions. Due to those afflictions, what we create is karma. And we have two links for karma. We have uh, the initial composition of karma that is deposited on, cons on consciousness. And then later on, we have the karma that has been activated in becoming or existence and then it says um, seven occur from two so the two are the two types of karma that we have and the seven that are derived from them are all the other links that are experiences of suffering and then it says uh, three are again derived from seven so from the seven that are, are all these intermediate experience. So as soon as we establish a rebirth, we will establish the name and form, the senses, the contact, the feeling, um, the aging and the death, right? So again, from whilst we experience all this, this will generate the three. And the three are the three afflictions of ignorance, craving and grasping. So we are back at the beginning. And then we repeat this. If you have the three afflictions, you will create the two types of karma. They will generate the seven types of suffering and so on and so forth. So really, when you think about this presentation, again, that makes you want to escape from samsara, come out of this samsara. And in order to do this, you have to recognize what is the cause, what is the root. We recognize ignorance as being the root. And we say, if you actually abandon that ignorance, you will not create projecting karma out of ignorance. If you don't create projecting karma out of this ignorance, you will not be talking about consciousness upon which karma is deposited. If you don't uh, deposit any karma, there will not be any craving or taking or existence because you will not have any karma to activate. And as a result of that, there will not be any rebirth, aging and death. So by st stopping the first one, which is ignorance, you stop every other consequent uh, link that follows. So when we do this presentation of the 12 links, usually there are two ways of looking at it. One is the way of entering and the other way is the way of reversing. So as you can see here, we have uh, given this presentation of uh, how uh, the, the stages that cause us to enter or engage samsaras. And we're looking at the sources of that and the sources that we identify is suffering and its origin. Or you can go with a more elaborate presentation of the 12 links. The point with both of those presentations is that we need to identify what is the initial cause that sets this whole thing in motion. And we identify the this confusion, this ignorance of grasping of the self as being at the very root. 
So having introduced that ignorance as being the fundamental cause that starts the whole process, then you start thinking, if I want to reverse or if I want to come out, if I want to stop this samsara, really I have to abandon this cause. I have to address this cause. And in order to be able to do that, you need to actually understand the nature of the path that will lead you to liberation, okay? So when we're looking at the nature of the path that will lead us to liberation in order to eradicate that ignorance, there are two things to consider. The first one is what type of physical basis, in other words, what type of rebirth will stop samsara? And the second one is what type of path will give an end to samsara? So two outlines here. Okay, so we're looking at the first outline, which is the type of physical basis or rebirth that will put an end to samsara. So Geshe Potawa was actually make the following comment. He says, when you wanted so much in the past, samsara did, did not stop by itself, nor will it stop by itself. You must stop it. Okay, so he's saying since beginningless time, we have been going around and round and round in cyclic existence. But this has not uh, caused samsara to come to an end. No matter how much time, how long, how many rebirths we have taken, no matter where you have, we have wandered in samsara, this didn't stop samsara, right? And samsara is not going to stop by itself. As it says, you must stop it. So he's saying you must make the effort to stop it. Unless you engage in some method, some technique, unless you put the effort from your side, samsara is not going to stop automatically by some other reason. So if you wanted to stop it, you must make the effort to stop this. And then it says, and the time to stop it is now that you have gained the optimum human rebirth. So he says, now that you have these precious human rebirth, you have the best opportunity, the best means. This is the time to exert yourself into this means that will put an end to samsara. So as we say, now that we have established the precious human rebirth, this is the best time to make an effort to stop samsara. Because if we fall into a type of rebirth where we have no freedom, we don't have the freedoms and the endowments that we have now. So if we find ourselves deprived of these types of freedoms, actually it is impossible to work so that we can stop and reverse samsara. So uh, it is right now that we have the precious human rebirth. But if we look at individuals who have the precious human rebirth, we can see there are two big categories. We have lay people and we have the ordained. The thing with lay people, although they might have the precious human rebirth, is that they have to be extremely busy carrying out various activities for the sake of um, you know, um, keeping up the lifestyle and so forth. So there is quite a lot, um, an opportunity for afflictions to arise and then carrying out your work or your activities by the influence of these afflictions. So any activity that you do, whether you're working in the fields, whether you are trading, whether you're selling, whether you're buying, you will be trying to, you know, um, uh, so kind of like um, deprive others of, uh, you know, make more profit and so on and so forth. And by being so busy in this way, you have many more obstacles to dedicating your time and energy to practicing Dharma. In comparison to the livelihood of the lay people, the livelihood of the ordained is much more simplified. There are fewer activities. They don't have to work so hard for the livelihood and do all those things. And therefore, they have less obstacles for um, uh, practicing the Dharma. And therefore, amongst precious human rebirths, the precious hu human rebirth of the ordained is the ideal physical basis for reversing samsara and practicing the path to liberation. And if you can uh, make sure that life after life you have, um, you are ordained, that will be the ideal way to follow the path that will lead you to liberation. 
So we're going to stop here for tonight in terms of the presentation. The next subject is the path that puts an end to samsara. Basically, this is the path of the three higher training. And we have the ethics, the concentration and wisdom. Concentration and wisdom really are presented later on at the practices of the individual of the great scope. So we will continue next week with the path that leads to liberation.